Have you seen a lot of movies this past year? I've seen many. Okay, all right. So do you make it a rule to try to see like- Yeah, absolutely. A movie Input you equals output. So if oh. you're, the, the interesting thing is if you want to write movies, I think you should watch movies and I think you should love movies. And you know, one of, I love movies. And so, you know, I just came back from Portland Film Festival where my deal with them was, I will teach classes in the afternoon as long as I have an all access patch to watch movies every night. And so, you know, you just get to see a whole bunch of movies that, because it's a film festival you might not ever see anywhere again. And so I, I love movies, I watch a bunch of movies. I, when I'm not you know, uh, paying full price to see a movie, I'm going to the North Hollywood Dollar Theater, which is actually $1.50, uh, and seeing movies on Sundays and Tuesdays when they're a buck fifty, and it's that way I catch up on stuff or movies that I look at and go, I'm not paying full price for that, buck fifty. Yeah, I think for me, I, I don't really care sometimes who's in a film. It doesn't, they don't have to be a big star. And, but dialogue is really important for me and it doesn't feel real. And a lot of times the more dialogue there is, the less real it feels. Right. How do we make a great scene where it's real? It's like, I just saw Straight out of Compton. It felt very. I haven't seen that yet, so oh, okay. I can't do. I can't do the comment on that. Okay, but but, but, but the, the dialogue general the general real. thing with dialogue mm -hmm. is the first thing. The biggest problem with dialogue um, is that writers often make it carry the burden of the story. When what you want to do is you want to tell the story visually. It's we're screenwriters, not speaker writers. There's a reason for that. So you want to tell the story visually and use the dialogue as icing on the cake. Once the dialogue. It doesn't have is it doesn't have the burden of telling the whole story. The dialogue can play, can be fun. I mean, it's still giving us parts of the story, but it, it's not carrying the whole story. So, you know, if you look at if you watch a movie and look at a, a great movie, often great movies have so much stuff that is dialogue free. Uh, there, the uh, I think it's Billy Wilder who did this, and the, the story goes to Billy Wilder, who is a great German screenwriter, came to the United States when the Nazis took over Germany, and was sleeping on Peter Lorre's couch, like many screenwriters. Uh, 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 Quentin Tarantino was sleeping on Scotty Spiegel's couch, and Scotty Spiegel got him a screenwriting job so that he could get him the hell off his couch. So Peter Lorre wanted to get um, Billy Wilder the hell off his couch, and uh, hooked him up, went to Paramount Pictures, and pitched him as the greatest visual storytelling screenwriter. And so they had a scene, and I, I want to say it's in Dodsworth, but I could be wrong, where it was a 10-page scene where a husband and wife have a argument, and through the argument we find out that the their relationship is no longer romantic or emotional in any way. They're just two people that live in the same house. And so there's 10 pages of dialogue, and they needed to cut it down, and Billy Wilder turned that into a half-page scene. Uh, and the half-page scene was husband and wife on the elevator of their building, um, husband's wearing his hat, wife's got a pur purse clutched to her chest, doors open, pretty woman gets on the elevator, husband takes off the hat and smiles at her, you know, and the wife basically takes a step away from the husband. That scene gives us pretty much all the information that the thrill has gone from this relationship without all that dialogue. And so always be looking for the scene that can demonstrate what's going on in the story rather than tell us through dialogue. That doesn't mean you have to get rid of dialogue, but it does mean that the dialogue can now be something else, can now have fun. Um, some of the keys to good dialogue, people want to have natural sounding dialogue. The problem with natural sounding dialogue is if you were to go, I, I took a class once where they said go record people in the wild. So I went to a mall and recorded people. And what I got, the most interesting thing I got was a guy who spoke entirely in belches. Um, and you could understand him. But what happens in the, in the wild, humans in the wild, when we speak, we talk and talk and talk and never get to the point. And that's a problem is in real life, real dialogue seems to never go anywhere. So what we don't want is real dialogue. We want something that appears to be real dialogue. And that means we're gonna craft something so that it sounds real. One of the ways to do that is to have characters misunderstand each other. Because bad dialogue in movies is when every character knows exactly what the other character is thinking when they say that. In real life, we don't know what the other character is saying. So if you say, um, I'm sick of your job, I'm sick of you working your job, we may hear, I'm sick of you, and respond to that. We come up with our response sometimes before the end of the sentence. So misunderstandings occur 
in real dialogue, and we create that. Um, I have a, a USA Network movie um, called Hard Evidence, which is only memorable because it was released on video after showing on USA Network a million times on the same day as a Julia Roberts movie called Something to Talk About. Both came out from Warner Brothers, and my movie outrented it in the nation. And I have no idea why, uh, except I did also see the Julia Roberts movie, which wasn't all that hot. But one of the things that happens in that script is it's about a, um, a guy who cheats on his wife, and while he's cheating on his wife, his mistress says she sells medical supplies, but actually what she is is a drug courier. And in the course of the story, um, he, she asks him to carry the gun to their meet because she usually goes with her boss. And don't worry, my boss has been there a million times. The gun always stays in the pocket, never comes out. They go to meet, the, do the exchange, and the um, guy they meet pulls out a badge and says, I'm with the DEA, you're busted. And she says, shoot him. And he goes, shoot him, I can't shoot him. And she, and basically she says, he's just claiming he's with the DEA, it's not real, shoot him. And so she eventually helps the husband shoot the guy. And then the husband has to go home to his wife and pretend like nothing happened. And so he's not just covering up the mistress, he's now covering up the mistress and the murder. Well, the wife thinks the husband's acting strange and decides to follow him and follows him as he goes to meet his mistress because he's freaked out about this whole thing. Goes to talk to the mistress about it because she's the only one he can talk to. He can't talk to his wife. So the wife sees the mistress, puts two and two together and confronts the husband and says, you know, I know that you're sleeping. Confronts the husband and says, I know what you did. And he's like, then she, it's, you're sleeping with this woman. He's like, whew. You know, it's only the mistress. And so she basically says, you know, uh, you're going to sleep on the sofa from this point on. Our, you know, we're, we're breaking up. So he goes down. They get into an argument. He sleeps on the argument. He's, 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 he's the one that cheated. So he's sleeping on the sofa. And the wife comes in one morning while he's in the kitchen and says, this is after a period of time has passed, and said, that sofa can't be too comfortable. What does he think she means? He thinks she means you can come up to the bedroom again. Right. So he says, so are you saying I can come up to the bedroom again? That's his misunderstanding. She says, no, I'm calling my lawyer. We're getting a divorce. You got to be out of here by sundown. So by creating that misunderstanding, it seems real. Right, right. So think about how to create misunderstandings where one character hears things different or hears what they want to hear. And then they respond to what they want to hear. And then they get the twist in there is the reality. So dialogue can now play, you know, when you, when it's not carrying the burden of the story, dialogue can play, dialogue can go down tangent places. Characters can say more amusing things. Um, another thing about dialogue is uh, think about how dialogue is character based. It all comes from characters. And if you take a, a different group of people and have them say things, they're going to say it in different ways. And one of the things that I always use as my example is I write a lot in Starbucks coffee shops where all the baristas are dressed the same. They all have the same basic dialogue. What will you be having? <laughs> Room for cream, etc. But each one is an individual and the spin they put on it, their attitude, comes out through the way they say things. So there is a barista at one of my Starbucks who puts the positive spin on everything. So if you come in and say, I lost my job today. She'll say, great, you can spend more time with your family. No matter how bad your life is, she puts the positive spin on everything. And she is so upbeat and chipper that I just want to kill her. But, uh, but that's her spin. There is a barista who everything is about himself. So if you come up and say, I want, you know, the, the uh, tea with two shots of melon, he goes, melon's not very good. I like the berry syrup. The berry syrup's better with this drink. And it's like, how, how, is, how does this become about you? No matter what you say, he turns it into his story. And so there are, these are these, all, all these people have the same dialogue, the same basic dialogue, but how they say it, with their spin they put on it, shows their character through you know, the same basic dialogue, but the spin on it. And so think about character, think about dialogue as being the extension of character and how we're gonna learn about that character through however they say their, you know, the generic line is this, now our job as writers is to take the generic line and do the specific to character line. You know, this character thinks this. This character um, believes that 
everything is sexual, if you know what I mean. You know, and there's that barista that does that. There's the barista that, you know, um, no matter what you do, the opposite of the shipper, you know, whatever, no matter what you do, it's always a terrible day for them. There's the, there's the barista that thinks that everyone's out to get them. It's the paranoid barista. It's like, you know, so, you know, uh, why are you asking about whether we have, you know, and it's like all these are different characters and they come out through basically the same pieces of dialogue said in different ways. So think about how the character comes out through dialogue and that makes it individual and, and interesting. You know, the, instead of saying the normal line, we now have the little spin on the line, which makes it a better line of dialogue.